You are listening to the Choose Your Struggle Podcast, a member of the Shameless Podcast Network. This week on the Choose Your Struggle Podcast, it's author, podcast host, and historian Emily Dufton. But first, Kid Metal, let's go. Things ain't always gonna go our way, but you can always win when you choose your struggle. And some battles will be yesterday, but today is for a new weekend. Choose your struggle, and don't worry about what they say, but you can always win when you choose your struggle. And you can bounce back, just as you Come on in, listen in to choose your struggle. Oh, choose your struggles. Choose your struggles. Oh, choose your struggles. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. Y'all, this is a big week. I don't, (laughs) I've been doing this long enough that I don't like fanboy a lot anymore, Uh, but I I certainly did with this episode. Uh, But before we get into this amazing episode, I do have to give a couple of shout outs. Uh, The first one is to a, a newer listener. Uh, and someone who who I now admire for the work they're doing. Uh, his name is Devannon Hubert, and we got connected a couple of weeks ago uh, where when, when he invited me on his show, which is called um, uh, Sex, Drugs, and Jesus. Uh, I know that the, 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 <laughs> the name is one that you're like, that doesn't sound like a show Jay would go on. Here's what's amazing is that it's, it, it is. I mean, it was one of the better interviews I've had in a while. Uh, we really had a just a fantastic chat. And Devannon is doing such cool work uh, in, in his uh, realm of this this world. Um, he And he's been so supportive of me in the brief time we've known each other. Not only did he jump on the birthday fundraiser, more on that in a second uh but he actually left a review of the show on apple uh, and i'm gonna read it real quick it says it's been so lovely to listen to this podcast it's rare to find conversations that are truly uncensored and authentic where they totally keep it real i think jay means all that he does from the heart and that shows here quite apparently uh devannon thank you so much for that review that's incredible um i appreciate that i mean that's literally like you just hit the nail on the head of why i do this because i care so deeply about this these topics so devannon thank you everybody check out the sex drugs and jesus podcast you'll hear me on there pretty soon it's a newer show uh but demanon also is really taking this from the heart so uh, applaud to him and and as as you know anytime i get a review it does get read on this show uh sometimes it takes a while that one uh, i was really lucky um the the, one of the the uh sort of data and 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 behind the scenes uh sites that i use uh sends me a a weekly sort of uh update about what's going on with the show um behind the scenes and sometimes it catches all reviews sometimes it doesn't uh it caught this one so thank you to venom uh as a reminder if you have apple you can leave the review right there if you don't uh there are other opportunities just look in the show notes where it says review uh this podcast and, and on apple please keep rating um over 120 of those and i love that that's so kind uh thank you so much um the other things I wanted to shout out are once again, I got to uh, I, I have to shout out my incredible uh, I mean, seriously, incredible supporters in Ghana. Um, I've been in your top 200 for about uh, six weeks now, two months. Uh, again, that's one of the, the, the sites that lets me know that stuff. Uh, thank you to all my listeners in Ghana. Sweden, I'm also in your top 200 right now, so thank you for that. Uh, really, really appreciate all of the listens around the world. Uh, U.S., you got to get on that because you're getting your butt kicked by uh, by the rest of the world. Um, so thank you to all of all of you for that. Uh, the fundraiser is over. We 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 wrap that up on Sunday. And uh, we're still waiting for the final numbers to trickle in. However, I can tell you, we blew the goal out of the water. We were almost uh, three times the goal. That That's how amazing we did. A uh, huge thank you to my family and some friends for donating. This, this is what was so amazing. On Facebook, we were just under $1,000, but we're close to 7000 total. Uh, so, you know... It, it, just incredible. I mean, I mean, people really took this and ran with it. And I love you all for that so much. I, I truly appreciate that. Every donation, there were a couple $5 all the way up to a couple thousand. Uh, so thank you. I, I 
really, really appreciate it. And Savage Sisters does too. A lot of amazing work coming with that. Uh, by the way, you will hear from uh, founder Sarah Laurel in the future. We're working on uh, making that work. And and, and also, t to be frank, um, we're working on making sure that we utilize her talents the right way. I mean, you know, with all the work that I do here, uh, we want and I want very much uh, Savage Sisters to be a focus. And so whether that's her telling a story on Rock Bottom um, or, or you know, a big interview here on the show, um, we're also talking about some other things. So, so stay tuned with that. Uh, there's going to be some cool work with Savage in the future. So uh, now we're going to get into today's episode because, as I said, uh, I do not always <laughs> uh, fanboy uh, anymore, but I did this week. Um, Emily Dufton, today's interview, is is someone that I just, I, I, I think her work is so cool. Um, she is a historian uh, of, of drug policy and, and drug use. Uh, she is a podcast host on the New Books Network. Uh, you'll hear her talk about that. Um, she is the author of one of my new favorite books. I heard about it when I saw her speak about three months ago. I, I, I kid you not when I said I bought it while listening to her speak, and I read it in probably three days. Uh, it is called Grassroots, the Rise and Fall and Rise of Marijuana in America. Uh, so good. Uh, so interesting. You'll hear us talk about on the on, on the show. The thing she really focuses on is a is a, sec a section of this history that kind of has been lost to history. You know, as we talk about on this, when we talk about the war on drugs, we talk about Nixon and then we talk about Reagan. We skip over uh, the entirety of Ford and Carter because there's this sort of, um, you know, the, the, the key points rising to the top, of course, or that Nixon gives a name and kicks off something that has already been happening for at this point over 50 years, uh, 60 years. And then uh, Reagan takes this sort of baby war on drugs and it just blows it up to this incredibly uh, just reign of terror that it has become. Well, as as Emily really highlights in this book, there is a incredible story in between those of how Nixon's war on drugs becomes Reagan's war on drugs. And, and of course, we all know Nancy Reagan's just say no, but but. We love to sort of skip over that, the, you know, the, the the decade in the middle there, and that decade is incredibly important to understanding what's going on. So Emily does an incredible job of highlighting uh, the Carter years and uh, the the parents' uh, uh, crusade uh, against um, mostly cannabis use um, th that happens in this in this period. So um, definitely. Uh, First off, enjoy this interview because Emily is so good at what she does. Also, she has a new book coming out, so follow her uh, all the places. She says it, and it's also in the show notes. But her book, her first book, you can get it at Bookshop. Uh, the, the link is in the, the show notes, as always. And, of course, just go to, to my Bookshop page, which is bookshop.org slash shop slash CYS. Uh, her book is highlighted on the front page this week with the other ones that she shouts out. Also... I normally only do this on Mondays, but I'm going to do something special today because I love this book so much and I want you all to read it. The first person who responds to this interview and says that they you know, loved hearing Emily or what they liked doesn't even matter. All you have to say is that you loved the or you heard the conversation with Emily and you want to read her book. The first person who does that is going to get it for free from me. I'm going to send it to you. So all you have to do is reach out. Uh, my website is always jshiffman.com, uh, social media, whatever, and say you love the conversation with Emily and uh, I will send you this book. Give me your address. Obviously, that's important. Uh, unfortunately, this is only for U.S. Uh, people. I cannot send this to the rest of the world. Um, but if you live in the U.S., I will send you this book for free. So uh, thank you to Emily, who is incredible. Um, and, you know, thank you to all of you for listening. This got really long, but that's cool. Without further ado, enjoy this conversation with Emily Dufton. In June of 2021, I accomplished something that is all too rare for those with lived experience. I told my story and made my call for change from a TED stage. The fact is, our society puts too much emphasis on those with learned experience. You know, the person who spent 20 years researching something. 
And that's okay because those voices are incredibly important. They provide the information that the rest of us run with. But we can't minimize the voice of those who've actually lived these experiences. That person doing research can't tell you what it really feels like to go through withdrawals, and they shouldn't want to. We need all voices at these tables. So if you're looking for someone who actually has lived these experiences, who can talk about struggling with mental health and substance misuse, who can talk about what it really feels like to go through addiction, who can speak eloquently about the war on drugs from both a learned and lived experience, reach out to me. And if you're looking to create a more complete experience, a round table or whole cadre of speakers, I can bring numerous people with me who have experiences that are unlike mine and unlike anything else that you've heard. So reach out to me today and let's create a complete learning experience for your office, your club, your school, or anywhere else because these voices need to be heard and these lessons can create change today. Reach out and let's all choose our struggle. Thanks for sharing the podcast with your friends. If you're listening on Apple, please rate and review or check out the review link in the show notes. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, uh, my name is Emily Dufton, and I'm a writer and drug historian and the author of Grassroots, The Rise and Fall and Rise of Marijuana in America. Which is a wonderful book, and I'm super excited to talk to you about that today because I, I flew through it and, and I read a lot. <laughs> I read a lot of these, and this is clearly one of my favorites. Uh, as you know, because I've tweeted about it endlessly, and you probably are <laughs> like, who the hell is this guy? Uh, <laughs> but before we do that, I think it's helpful to understand, you know, as I was joking uh, before we started recording, nobody just falls into this work. So so what made you choose the topic or, or what what pointed you towards drug history as your, your main focus here? I'd say that there are two key moments that, that made grassroots uh, come into being, and they both occurred long before uh, I had even entered grad school uh, and kind of thought about writing a dissertation about the parent movement, which became grassroots. It actually goes back to 2003, when I uh, took a bus from New York, where I was an undergrad at NYU, down to Washington, D.C. to protest uh, America's invasion of Iraq. And I'm wandering around the National Mall, and um, I'm seeing people in tie-dye, and there are drum circles, and there are signs and there are posters. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, as a student of history, I certainly know what visions of this look like. And it looks like protests against uh, the Vietnam War, which of course were at that point 40 years, 30 years prior. And I really wondered about that. I wondered about what made social activism effective or ineffective. In short, I was wondering, why were we still using the same methods to protest wars? And the wars continued. This, this activism didn't seem to work. So I'd always been interested in, in kind of questions about efficacy as far as activism was concerned. But the thing that pushed me then into drug history specifically was a chance encounter with Martin Torgoff's book, Can't Find My Way Home, America in the Great Stone Age, 1950 to 2000. And that book is just incredible. It's this like amazingly well-written, uh, very narrative, very uh, fun history of drug use in the United States in the second half of the 20th century. And it just made me realize how deeply connected uh, drugs, drug use, laws against drug use and laws increasing access to drugs were, they were integral to, to ideas that really interested me about culture and about art, but also about liberty and freedom and how we, how we use uh, laws in America to guide, increase the enjoyment of or decrease the enjoyment of American life. So I was kind of coming into grad school in uh, 2008 with these two ideas, one about drug history being really cool and one about activism being, um, you know, a question of how, how it could actually be effective. And so I started thinking then, um, well, how can I, how can I do something with this? And I realized one of the most important and effective forms of activism that I had ever witnessed in my entire life was anti-drug activism in the 1980s and that bled into the 1990s when I was a kid. I was a bit too young for the height of just say no, but I remembered it's sort of long tringle, like, you know, after effect, it's like long tail. And I thought, God, that was like a weird thing to live through. 
that seems like really effective activism. Definitely seems like a cool period of, our, of drug history that prior to that point, not a lot of people had paid too much academic attention to. So I wrote uh, my entire uh, PhD dissertation on the parent movement, uh, which was the anti-drug activist movement in the 1970s and 80s, and then expanded that into grassroots where basically I said, you know, you can't just write about the parent movement, you have to write about the activists that came before and after. And um, that's the incredibly lengthy description of where my book came from. <laughs> you asked, so you got I, it. <laughs> I did. and, I, and that. So I want to say, first off, I love when a... a you can pinpoint a turning point in your life to a book mm. because that is such a beautiful thing that I, 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 you know, I might be wrong and I kind of hope I am, but I kind of think that's happening less that mm. there are books that, you know, when we were young, I'm not that much younger than you, uh, before, before the internet, uh, we, we didn't have a lot of these options today to where to get our, our sources of, of news slash entertainment. And so I can think of, you know, I still love the book, um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy because I've been <laughs> reading it since I was 10. You know what I mean? So right. I, 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 I love stories like that, that are so influential. And obviously I can think of a couple of those myself. I mean, I, I just had a DJ. Jaffe, who wrote Abstinence Myth uh, on, on this podcast a couple weeks ago, and as a guy in recovery who didn't come AA, that book was really a turning point for me because I didn't know there were other people like me in, in recovery. And so I love that, that, that you, you, you have that story. And I think what's so interesting, I didn't know that, that, that your sort of the grassroots came from your dissertation, but it makes sense because... As I told you before we started recording, I read a lot of these. It's almost an obs it is an obsession. I'll call it what it is. <laughs> it is an obsession. But your book was the first one that that I, I think correctly, in a way that made sense to me as a reader, tied Jimmy Carter and the founding of Normal through the parents movement to the focus that we always take on the war on drugs, Ronald Reagan, right? And 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 there hasn't been enough, I think. Th th that really gets in and gets your hands dirty with that storyline, mm. which I found to be absolutely fascinating. That that because we don't talk, we or at least those of us who are a little bit younger don't really remember Jimmy Carter's mm -hmm. presidency that much at all, and especially his his hands on approach when it came to the pot. We almost had uh, decriminalization. And then we get Ronald Reagan and we kind of just go, oh, what a crazy turn of events. But no, as you correctly <laughs> write about, there is a really strong tie in there. So for the for the listeners who may not know the story, can we talk about – can you start with Keith – is it Strope or Stroop? Strop. It rhymes with Strop. That's how he There we go. It. Strop rhymes <laughs> with cop. <laughs> so can we start with, with Jimmy Carter and Keith Strop? And go through that parents movement a little bit to, to the story we know about Ronald Reagan. Can you help us understand that that storyline a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Um, the 70s are crazy, aren't they? The 70s <laughs> are just nuts. And I'm obsessed with them. And I want to know everything about that decade. Because as one famous historian put it, it seems like nothing happened. And yet <laughs> so much changed in the United States in the 1970s. It's wild. Uh, so the story of Steve, uh, Keith Strop and, and Carter, it goes back a little bit earlier than that. It goes back to 1970, um, when a couple of things changed in the United States, um, and that included how all uh, drugs were uh, considered legally on the federal level. So 1970, under President Nixon, sees the passage of the Controlled Substances Act, which I'm sure your listeners will be familiar with because it puts drugs into one of five schedules uh, from one to five, schedule one being drugs that are considered uh, the most pr uh, prone to abuse uh, with the least medical value. So that includes um, heroin, uh, LSD, numerous others, and then all the way down to schedule five, which uh, are drugs that are considered to have a low level of abuse and high level of medical value. So that's like, uh, you know, cough syrup with codeine in it and stuff like that. Uh, this is a very big shift, right? Because it basically took the regulation of drugs out of the medical establishment and it put it into law enforcement's hands. Uh, the five schedules are determined by the Department of Justice, not uh, the FDA or the Department of Health and Human Services. This is a big deal because 
obviously marijuana use was rising in America in the 1960s and early 1970s. And Nixon wanted to put pot into Schedule 1. He wanted to say it was one of the most dangerous drugs in America. And Keith Straub, the guy you were talking about before, he really disagreed with this. He was essentially a consumer rights activist who had worked for Ralph Nader. And he thought that there was this booming, growing population of cannabis users in the United States. And he suggested that they shouldn't be considered criminals because of their drug use. They should be considered customers because of their drug use. This is a drug that the federal government had said was no worse or more harmful than alcohol or tobacco in a series of federal reports going back to the 19th century. And Straub basically said, why are you criminalizing all these people when you could actually be making tax dollars off of them? So he founded NORML, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws in 1970, the same year uh, the Controlled Substances Act was enacted. And he was basically a Washington lobbyist for pot rights. He was not very powerful or influential for a long time <laughs> until 1976 rolls around and Jimmy Carter runs successfully for president. Now, things had been changing on the state level uh, for a number of years. Uh, between 1972 and 1978, 13 states actually decriminalized the possession of up to an ounce of cannabis for personal possession. This was a huge change, and it was basically a direct result of the Controlled Substances Act. You know, if this was going to be made illegal on a federal level, well, most drug arrests occur on the state level anyway, and a group of very young progressive legislators uh, were elected on the state level and they decriminalized pot uh, for about a third of the country's population, which is a huge step. Carter was supportive of these states' rights efforts. And when he came into the White House, he um, ran on a basic platform of support for decriminalization. It wasn't a huge component of his presidential candidacy, but it was there. And when he came to the White House, he brought with him a man named Peter Bourne, who was his chief drug, uh, basically drug advisor. Bourne and Strop had uh, an interesting relationship. Um, they worked together. Uh, Bourne agreed that decriminalization was a good thing. He also supported the decriminalization of cocaine. But he and Strop like, really butted heads a lot. They both have very strong personalities. They look, both like to be sort of the voice in the room. And I think those two, it was like the polar ends of magnets. They just kept like turning away from each other. And and on that, because I think this is, this is really interesting, I don't know, and please tell me if you think differently, that Peter Bourne would be able to get the, the job that he gets today because he comes from what we kind of would call a harm reduction background. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that isn't it, – it, it's sort of like it, it, a really interesting arc where that's accepted because it's it's medical in, in, in the age that he comes in and it doesn't really get – you know, politicized until more recently. He, I thought, and, and, and I haven't read that much about him. I thought he was a really fascinating guy in reading oh, that totally. book. Yeah, yeah, he rocks. I've talked to him a bunch of times. We went actually went out to lunch together once, uh, met up in DC, and the waitress thought he was my grandfather, and I thought that was <laughs> adorable. Uh, <laughs> but no, Peter Bourne is not my grandpa. Sorry, waitress. Um, he's a fascinating guy. His uh, his father was an Australian doctor and scientist who discovered like vitamin C in the human body. He was originally uh, from England, but came to the United States. I was kind of raised here and uh, went to Emory for medical school, kind of in the Atlanta, Georgia area, which is how he hooks up with uh, Jimmy Carter. But he was a guy who, when Carter was governor of Georgia, prior to his presidential run, um, Bourne was the one who implemented uh, the state's um, heroin treatment programs which were, I don't know if they necessarily fall under the rubric of harm reduction today, but this was in the early 1970s when 
there is a big federal emphasis on providing free or low cost treatment for opioid, you know, opioid use disorder at the time. So, you know, anyone using heroin at the time and wanted treatment could go into any number of clinics in the Atlanta area for free access to methadone counseling, uh, therapy, medical uh, assistance, assistance with housing and education, you know, and Bourne was overseeing these programs, this vast network of treatment systems. So he's coming in with this idea that there are drugs that are immensely harmful to public health. And for the most part, those are drugs like heroin, where you have a higher overdose rate. He saw drugs like marijuana and, and even cocaine as being less harmful to public health and therefore less of a criminal justice or even public health issue and more of an issue of why don't we focus on the drugs that are killing people as opposed to the drugs that aren't? And that's where we should be paying you know, attention. That's where we should be putting our, our money. And And I don't I don't know if, I don't think that that kind of image would be unwelcome in Washington right now. I think perhaps we could use more of those voices in Washington, but he certainly would not have been welcome uh, in the 1980s and 90s. <laughs> and 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 from my understanding in reading your book, it sounded like Strop and him just kind of butted heads because of their ideology, not where they were. They were both kind of trying to go to the same place, just from very different rationalities. Yeah, and I think both kind of wanted to be, they both wanted to be the leader, right? They both wanted to be the leader. And um, I think that's hard, you know, when when you want to be the person in charge and someone else also wants to be in charge and you're kind of fighting over, who, you know, who the big cheese is going to be. I say a lot of the, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's two very big egos. And I say this with love because I actually really like both of these men. Um, and I've talked to both of them repeatedly, but I, I found them to be two very big egos that you know, neither one wanted to make room for the other <laughs> in this space. And, and Strop just does something that later even he regrets. And, uh, you know, he he kind of, uh, well, you tell this story, the, the, the brief version, because this story is fascinating. I want people to go read your book. So let's not give away the entire thing. But <laughs> he leads to, to a, kind of a major downfall in, in, in for, for Peter. Precisely. Yeah. So... The cool thing about normal in the 1970s is that they had rockin' awesome Christmas parties. Um, they would rent a big townhouse in Georgetown, and every floor would be packed with people, and there was you know, jugglers and food and entertainment and bands. And, you know, rumor had it that there were you know, silver trays of joints being passed around, uh, things like that. Peter Bourne attended... Normal's Christmas party in December of 1977. He didn't really want to, but he also wanted to preserve his positive relationship with Keith Strop. They were working together. Uh, Strop had recently actually drafted a statement Carter had made in support of decriminalization. They had a relationship that needed to be tended. Uh, so Bourne decided to go to Normal's Christmas party uh, at the end of 77. Rumor has it that Upon arrival, Bourne was ushered upstairs to kind of the VIP room um, where individuals, including Christy Hefner, uh, Hugh Hefner's daughter, and Hunter S. Thompson, among others, were snorting cocaine. And rumor has it that Peter Bourne snorted some of this cocaine. Keith Strop was in the room. That's what he says happened. That is not what Peter Bourne says happened. Peter Bourne says that he did not snort cocaine at the normal Christmas party. <laughs> and this disagreement is key, essentially, to the dissolution of Peter Bourne's federal career. <laughs> Which is just... Uh, so, I mean, first off, that party sounds incredible, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I would love to go to that party in, in 1977. Um, but, but, but even more so... This was, if, if I, from reading your book, it was sort of Keith Strop trying to get the upper hand and he doesn't realize that, yeah, he may have won this small battle, but he ends up really costing himself in this war in the long term. Exactly. So uh, about seven months later, in July 1978, um, Bourne gets himself into trouble. He writes his secretary a uh, prescription for quaaludes, which are, you know, a, a tranquilizer um that were being used uh kind of on the on the underground uh, as an enhancement for sex and he writes this prescription for his like young attractive secretary for quaaludes for drugs being used for sex and he writes it under a false name 
And it's just very shady, right? It's very, very shady. The secretary gives it to her roommate to have filled, which is also like, why would you do that? <laughs> and at the time, um, there's sort of a like an investigator in the pharmacy who's checking on prescriptions, especially for drugs that are being used um, in illicit ways to make sure that the prescriptions are legit. Well, this prescription is not legit. It's for a false name. And it has Carter's chief drug advisor's name on the prescription pad. It's not, the optics aren't great, right? So it gets called in, um, the report gets spread far and wide immediately. And because Straub is already kind of upset with Bourne for a variety of reasons, he basically drops a dime on him where, you know, the day after the Washington Post reports that Carter's drug advisor is writing illegal Quaalude prescriptions for his attractive young secretary, Strop um, anonymous, anonymously tips uh, another reporter off that he also, that Bourne was also using illegal drugs at the normal Christmas party a couple of months prior. And this is just like, it's just too much to, to contain, to control. And Bourne resigns from the White House pretty much immediately thereafter. And that, that makes any attempt at decriminalization or any soft approach towards drugs completely off limits for the White House. Uh, Carter can't talk about it anymore because there's been too much scandal and intrigue and and shame surrounding illicit drug use uh, at the highest level, uh, including by Peter Bourne. And Carter essentially has to turn away from this subject. So there was almost like this wave was building toward decriminalization on state and federal levels until this remarkable turnaround occurs entirely because of two kind of mistakes or rumored mistakes by Carter's chief drug advisor, uh, Peter Bourne. And that's, that's a bummer. Imagine if that hadn't happened, where we would be <laughs> today. And, and I think that that is, a, that is a, a period that you're going back to a point you made earlier, where it's like, it seems like nothing happened in the 70s. This is a story that kind of has been forgotten by, by, you know, we're seeing a lot of this work happening now. And as your book really beautifully kind of lays out towards the end, it's like, you know, yes, we're, we're on this great upswing, but let's just make sure we do better work this time because we kind of saw this before. And, and as you pointed out, what was so remarkable about this was that the backlash was building in the late 70s as this is all going on, as positives are happening and they were just being overlooked. And that is the parents movement, which is this period that I had very little knowledge of before your book. Exactly. The parent movement is fascinating to me. I am I am obsessed with it. Um, <laughs> so the big difference between decriminalization and legalization of, uh, of an intoxicant is that decriminalization doesn't necessarily place any regulations or restrictions over access to that drug. It just says that if you have an amount of it that is below, you know, conviction level, essentially, that's okay. You can have that drug. Uh, you can have access to that drug. But it doesn't say who can, uh, who who can sell the drug, who can buy the drug, how that drug can be trafficked, uh, anything like that. It's really quite hands-off in that sense. And that became a real problem, not only for possession of cannabis itself, but also for the burgeoning cannabis paraphernalia marketplace, um, which was just huge in the 1970s. Like, I can't quite get, get over this, you know? Um, the economy was bad in the 70s, right? There was a series of oil embargoes. There was uh, stagflation where wages were stagnant, even though the costs of uh, goods were rising. The American economy was very much so uh, tanking. It was a real problem. But one growth area uh, was soaring above all others, and, and that was the sale of drug paraphernalia, uh, fueled by advertisements in a wide variety of pot-based magazines like High Times, which is still around, and other ones that aren't, like Stoned and Stone Age, and like all these copycat, ma copycat magazines that, that pretty much went out of circulation shortly thereafter. You could go into a head shop or you can order by the mail. You could get pipes, you could get bongs, you could get rolling papers, you could get toys, you could get grinders, you could get like anything. And a lot of this stuff was 
completely off the wall, you know, like the Busby, which was a Frisbee that had a pipe in it. So you could like literally puff, puff, pass. Um, and, you know, bongs that looked like spaceships and, you know, things that were tied into movies. So to the point where by 1977, sales of paraphernalia were more than the amount that the original Star Wars movie grossed that year. Wow. That's how much money was being made in pop paraphernalia. And there was no restrictions whatsoever on who could buy this stuff. So because you could get a bong at a 7-Eleven or at a record shop and kids, if they had money, would, were able to purchase this stuff, there was this unregulated marketplace that some parents believe started to cater to children. And that was a real problem for them. When they started to realize that not only were kids accessing paraphernalia, but they're also accessing the drug itself, and that rates of adolescent drug use were rising to the point where they were highest in 1978, 1979, than any other point in American history, that's when parents really started to have a problem with the decriminalization, uh, basically, marketplace and system. So the movement itself started in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1976, when a mom named, um, her nickname was Keith, her first name was actually Marcia, uh, when Marcia Keith Shuhard started organizing parents in her neighborhood against adolescent marijuana use after she caught her daughter and her friends smoking pot in their backyard at her 13th birthday party, it took off and through some really savvy community organizing, the parent movement, which was, you know, basically said, It told parents to organize together within their neighborhoods, within their communities, to keep kids away from pot, get the paraphernalia out of their bedrooms, give them alternative activities, and kind of, you know, keep them away from drugs while their bodies and minds were still maturing. This became a national uh, activist movement to the point where by May of 1980, they were so strong and so powerful that they had a national umbrella organization based right outside of Washington, D.C. It was huge. They had over 3,000 parent groups in all 50 states. And this is where we sort of catch up with the common knowledge of the of the war on drugs, which is where the sort of the first family against drugs gets into the White <laughs> House. And the parent group, it, it's almost like... Obviously, this isn't a coincidence because the the parent movement had a lot of uh, uh, weight or behind them at this point. And, and if, if I understand your, again your book correctly, that's kind of a major reason why Nancy Reagan really gets heavily into this. But the Ronald Reagan was super anti drugs already. I mean, it, it, maybe he takes it up a notch after this. But they sort of find two groups very willing to work with each other. That the timing is just perfect. Oh, yeah. It's a total moment of historical kismet. It, it couldn't have been better for either the parent movement or Nancy Reagan. So when 1980 rolls around and Ronald Reagan is elected president, you have to understand that like Nancy Reagan was not the Nancy Reagan that she is now. She was not this you know, anti-drug warrior and beloved by the American public. She was incredibly unpopular. Everybody hated her, Um, (laughs) just just couldn't stand her. She seemed very, I think someone called her like the Lady Macbeth of California politics. She seemed very conniving. Uh, She seemed very invested in her husband's career and, you know, just someone who wanted power as opposed to someone who wanted to, you know, help the nation's kids stay off drugs. It was, uh, no one liked her. So she came into the White House needing um, a PR image makeover And parent activists, although they had already had some success, right, uh, the guy who followed up Peter Bourne as Carter's chief drug advisor, Lee Dogoloff, he supported the parents, uh, the parents main stance, he agreed that children should not use drugs. So they already had support in the White House. But Jimmy Carter wasn't going to kind of embrace an anti drug stance. After Peter Bourne, he was just kind of kind of let it rest. And also he had to deal with like, Iran hostage crisis and all this other stuff. Like he had other things on his mind. Uh, But Nancy Reagan, like, but they needed basically a a strong person to really help their platform go totally national and perhaps international. 
And Nancy Reagan needed an image makeover. So they started working together. As soon as Nancy Reagan was in the White House, parent activists actually went to visit her and her chief drug advisor, whose name was Carlton Turner. They laid out their uh, basic platform and Nancy Reagan adopted it and said, you know, this is what I'm going to focus on. This is going to be my stance as first lady. And by essentially usurping the parent movement's program, by taking it to a national and an international level, Nancy Reagan was able to become the most prominent anti-drug warrior uh, and most, the most well-known anti-drug warrior of, of the 20th century. She's up there with like Carrie Nation, you know? <laughs> well, so before we, we continue talking about that, because I think that her story, where, your story about her, where she kind of steals Just Say No, is fascinating. <laughs> Let's pause real quick and shout out where people can follow you. Obviously, where they can pick up the book, because that's incredibly important. And anything else you want everybody to know. Awesome. Sure. So you can pick up the book anywhere. Um, for the most part, I think it is certainly sold online. You got to um, check out alternatives to Amazon if possible, but you can also get it from there. That's fine. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Emily underscore Dufton. Um, that's probably the best place. You can check out my website. And if you have any questions, everybody can email me at emily.dufton at gmail.com. I'm always happy to talk more about this stuff with anyone who has further questions. So, yes, uh, the book is available. Uh, I, I got it off of a Bookshop. Um, it, it, obviously, it's in the show notes, as always. And, and, you know, Bookshop was so kind to feature me a couple weeks ago. And yours was one of the ones that was on my front page at the time. So that was yes, nice. Thank well, you. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, and, and, yes, definitely follow you because you have a lot of really interesting content on your Twitter about drug history. The Choose Your Struggle podcast has been so lucky to have numerous truly change-making authors on this show. From Adi Jaffe to Emily Dufton, we have been blessed by hearing them speak, and now it's time to grab their works. Now, you could go to Amazon if you wanted to shop online, but let's be honest, that's not the right choice. So I'm going to invite you to head over to my partner, Bookshop. If you go to bookshop.org slash shop slash CYS, again, that's bookshop.org slash shop slash CYS, you're going to find all of your favorite books and you're going to support the podcast in the process. But that's not even the best part. Bookshop has an incredible program that allows you to select your favorite mom and pop or neighborhood bookstore and they will give them some of the proceeds from your order. Now, living here in Philly, that's been a really hard choice because we have fantastic bookstores all over, but I selected Harriet's, which is a truly wonderful black-owned bookstore in Northern Philly. I love it, my wife loves it, we go there as much as we can. Honestly, why would you go anywhere else? So again, go check out Bookshop at bookshop.org slash shop slash CYS. You're gonna find the book you're looking for, you're gonna support your neighborhood bookstore, and you're gonna support the podcast in the process. So check it out today, and go ahead and buy that book you've been waiting for. Find me on social media. Check the link in the show notes or search for me, Jay Schiffman, on YouTube and LinkedIn, and choose your struggle on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I think, obviously, we want to talk about your new book. Before we get to that, to, to kind of finish the, this this point about Nancy Reagan, I, again, I, I, I did not know this story that she kind of steals Just Say No from a, a group that was the real founders of this. Now, of course, uh, I literally gave a TED Talk three weeks ago where I talk about Dare and Just Say No, and I even in that TED Talk said Nancy Reagan's Just Say No because that's how <laughs> we remember this. It was not Nancy Reagan's Just Say No, was it? No, it was uh, Just Say No was the brain product of a very nice uh, black grandmother from Oakland, California named Joan Bran. And she is not as much a part of American drug history as she should be. Um, I was not able to find her and contact her. I think she lives like a really quiet life now. She's, she's quite elderly. Uh, but I... I really regret what happened to Joan Brand. I feel really bad for her uh, because Just Say No is 
when it was started in 1984, it was so different from this very whitewashed, simplistic image of just say no that we have today. When Joan Brand started it in 1984 in Oakland, uh, she started it because she really wanted to give Black youth an alternative, um, a way to grow up that was away from the drugs and crime that had really riddled Oakland neighborhood where she was living. She wanted to give them a positive space for uh, social and community development. She had a lot of, uh, you know, black pride in um, sort of one of my sort of like stuff we worked into her program. It was just an extraordinary action that she was getting some funding from uh, funding for from the federal government. She was working with uh, another parent activist named Tom Adams, who was quite good at writing grants. And this was starting to become something powerful and something that she was really proud of. But Tom Adams wanted more federal resources. He wanted Nancy Reagan to know about this program that Joan Brand was doing in Oakland that was starting to generate so much success. And it almost worked too well. Uh, Nancy Reagan came to Oakland. She uh, gave a talk to this, you know, school children that Joan Brand was trying to work with. And she's the one where the words just say no did essentially come from Nancy Reagan. She had visited this school. Uh, you know, she was asked by a child, what would you, what should I do if someone uh, offers me drugs? And Nancy Reagan says, just say no. So in a way she does inspire this, but an organization that was dedicated to the development of black urban youth was not exactly what Just Say No became. Mm -hmm. um, Bran and Adams founded the Just Say No Foundation to essentially bring their organization nationwide. But Nancy Reagan liked it so darn much that she decided to essentially sell it to Procter & Gamble, <laughs> the organization that makes things like Duncan Hines kick mix and toothpaste and stuff like that. Procter & Gamble kicked out Joan, and, uh, Joan Brand and Tom Adams from the leadership of Just Say No, installed corporate leadership, and essentially turned Just Say No from a very active community development organization into an extension of a company that makes home goods. And Nancy Reagan, of course, was the face of that and she promoted just say no once it was a corporate entity as opposed to when she was kind of oh it's a very nice organization there in Oakland when it mostly worked with black youth it is a stunning transformation of an organization that I think started off with a lot of promise and became little more than um you know a chance to sell coupons to kids you know <laughs> Yeah, and, and and I mean, there's just so much wrong with this story, right? I mean, obviously the whitewashing is a big part of it, and the corporate takeover. But you also have, at its heart, yes, it is a is a sort of a community development uh, idea that that starts with this beautiful vision and becomes what we now remember it as a way to sort of not teach real drug education as a way to avoid talking about this subject that's very important to talk to young people about and instead you have this catchy slogan that can be sold for their breakfast cereal and it it, it, it you know, that is the part, I think, of this story that everybody knows. Of, co of course, those of us who got this in school, right along with D.A.R.E., which was a very equal, uh, not, first off, didn't work, but also very harmful uh, uh, educational uh, or, or attempt at education. And and we don't know, as you, you've said, the really sad background of this story. It's a, it's, it's a dramatic oversimplification of... Of I think well, what Joan Brand was trying to do, you know, she saw a lot of depression in her community. She saw that children didn't have a lot of opportunities. So what Brand and others were trying to do was organize systems where, you know, youth were being mentored by successful members of their community. They were given um, a sense of foundation and stability and joy, right? There's a sense of community there. And I don't think anything prevents drug misuse better than having a sense of community and joy and and fulfillment in your life. So what Just Say No started off as, as a means to reclaim lives and prevent them from, you know, prevent children from going down this, this path of, of depression and desolation that oftentimes leads to drug misuse became, well, just say no. Why don't you just say no? 
And it totally ignored all of the social and environmental circumstances that oftentimes surround problematic drug use. It was a dramatic oversimplification. And, you know, the fact that Just Say No today is remembered either, you know, with sort of like distaste or or mockery, like Mm -hmm. that's like it could have been so cool. Like it could have been an okay thing. And instead, what Nancy Reagan did with it was... Well, it's what she did, and we remember it. I think. I think you know when you mock the idea of just say no, it's because it became a really mockable idea, um, which sucks. It could have been. It could have been okay, you know. <laughs> sort of to to go back to to what I said earlier, we are mocking Nancy Reagan's just say no, not right. Jones' just say no. Yeah, you know, very different, same name. Yes. Uh, which is which is very sad. So uh, clearly, if if you're listening to this and you're like, "Wow, this is fascinating," you got to go buy the book because we just <laughs> did, uh, you know, half an hour of what I, I, you know, I read this thing probably in about three days. I was so fascinated by this book. <laughs> but this is not all. You actually, you two other things I want to talk about. First off, your your new book, which sounds incredible, but also you are a host of a really fantastic podcast that I want to talk about just a little bit too. So let's do the book first. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I am. I'm still early in. I'm still, I should be further along, but I'm not. <laughs> Don't tell my editor. Um, I'm currently working on my second book, uh, which is the history of the development and commercialization of the industry that makes medications for opioid use disorder. Uh, so I'm talking about the history of three drugs specifically, which are methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. And listeners might know some of these drugs by their brand names. That's kind of how they're referred to often in the media. So I'm talking about the history of methadone, which we all know from the clinics, uh, the history of drugs like Suboxone, uh, which is a combination of buprenorphine and naltrex- uh, naloxone, and naltrexone, which is better known um, in its long-form injectable version as um, a Vivitrol. So it's the history of the development of these drugs, none of which are new, Uh, most of which are at least 50, if not 60 or 70 years old. Uh, The participation of the federal government in the development of these drugs, and then the takeover by private industry, which has now made these drugs relatively inaccessible uh, to people who really need them, but available only within a system that generates enormous amounts of profit for the people who do control access to these substances. Um, I know that the privatization story in American healthcare isn't new, but I don't think, I I find very few instances where it's told specifically about drugs that are used in treatment and recovery for opioid use disorder. And because 90,000 people died last year of uh, overdoses, oftentimes related to opioids, I felt like this was a really important story to tell. How essentially did we get to this point where there are drugs that are available that can be enormously useful. Most people can't access them, and yet they are immensely profitable to the few people who are in power controlling them. Um, it seems really shady, and the more research I'm doing, as it turns out, it is. And that's been wild and depressing. Uh, so I'm writing this book for the University of Chicago Press. Um, it's probably going to take me about another year, but it should be available um, as soon as I get cracking. <laughs> Well, I can't wait. I, this this sounds fascinating, and it's definitely uh, while why these are not more widely available is a is number one in the community. Obviously, a giant frustration, but also would be very interesting to sort of learn more about. Um, and, and by the way, my listeners uh, know naltrexone because we had Claudia Christian from. Uh, the Sinclair Method uh, DVD or, or documentary uh-huh. on here a couple of weeks ago. And I got multiple people reaching out and going, wait, this is a thing? It's like, yeah, this has been a thing for a long time. Long time. And mm-hmm. it's just not a lot of access to it. So we will definitely keep an eye out for this book and I'll be I'll be excited to read it. But also, <laughs> let's, let's before we close, talk a little bit about the New Books Network, which I think is a really cool, my wife has now gotten into this podcast network. Cool. This is a fascinating. I, re, I, I learned about it because of seeing you speak and now i love uh the new drugs uh new uh, the, the the podcast specifically about uh, books on new drugs which i think is fant- fantastic 
Oh, I'm so glad you like it. That's great. Yeah, New Books Network is awesome. Um, it's run by this guy named Marshall Poe, who has, I think there's over 700 people who do interviews for the channel. Um, we interview people who have written new books. That's why it's called the New Books Network, which makes sense uh, about topics that we're interested in. So I interview people for the Drugs Addiction and Recovery channel. Um, I just actually wrapped up an interview with the a guy who worked as a statistician for the uh, U.S. Drug, uh, drug Use and Health Survey for about 40 years. And he wrote a wow. book called War Stories from the Drug Survey, which was great. Uh, but I've talked to a number of authors who have written new books about drug history. And uh, it's an absolute joy to talk to these writers and hear more about their processes and their findings. And um, yes, all of the all of the all of the interviews are available. Just uh, search for New Books Network uh, wherever you get your podcasts. I feel like a commercial right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, what I what I hate about the New Books Network is that my to read list grows every time I listen to an interview because <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. This will now be the 40th book I, I'm adding to my list. So. Uh, Definitely loved that, and, and, and you know, uh, again, I, I found that because I saw you speak a, a little while ago, and um, definitely am, am enjoying kind of going back into some old episodes and learning more about what's out there. Oh, so yeah. before we get to the final questions, though, this has been wonderful. If you wouldn't mind one more time shouting out where people can buy your book and follow you online. Yeah, so buy the book wherever you can. Ideally, go to bookshop.org, as Jay recommended. And you can follow me on Twitter at Emily underscore Dufton. And I actually had to look up my, my handle. I was like, oh, no, he asked me my handle. And I didn't know what it was. So I looked it up real quick. And luckily, I got it in time. So I'm Emily underscore Dufton. <laughs> And definitely go follow her there. You had a nice, uh, a nice thread. I, th I think I retweeted last week uh, about uh, some really interesting drug policy takes. So definitely check that out. Now we finish with the same two questions every time. Number one, what self care habits work for you? I am a daily runner. I wake up at five o'clock every weekday wow. to get out the door uh, after I have some coffee and run. Uh, for 45 minutes to an hour before my kids get up. And that is that has kept me sane through this pandemic. <laughs> uh, and I, I am it's nuts and but I'm luckily a morning person and it keeps me it keeps me going. <laughs> Uh, so last question is, we've now spent the last 45 minutes hearing why you're amazing and we all should be following your work. But but shout out, this is your chance to shout out some people that we should be following, whether it's people you follow online or, or what are you reading, what are you watching, listening to, anything like that. Oh, man. Oh, let's see. Um Boy, why am I like stumped by this for some reason? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um this is the hardest one. People always get stumped by this because they're like, there's so many people so I could shout many. out. Where do I start? Where do I start? You know, I've got to say, <laughs> I've really been enjoying the podcast Great Moments in Weed History uh, by David Bienenstock. And um, why am I forgetting the name of the other host? They have been doing some really fun very just like they make me giggle some really great pieces on weed history i really recommend uh their episode on alice b toklas it's actually a couple of years old at this point but uh she's one of my favorite sort of prominent characters in the history of cannabis uh worldwide and great moments in weed history is a really really fun podcast that i i just get an absolute chuckle out of. The other thing I would actually recommend um, podcast wise is the vaping fix, uh, where um, a really great reporter told the history of Juul and its development and its effects, its unanticipated effects. So those two things have been enlightening as far as drug history is concerned. I just find that um, podcasts are killing it on drug history right now. And that's what I fill my ears with when I go for my daily run. So check those out. I literally just went and grabbed my phone to look up great moments in weed history. That nice. sounds wonderful. They're super um, fun. 
I'm excited to listen to this, although I will say, as a fellow runner, I don't know. My, my dad's the same way. He listens to this show as he runs. I don't know how you do it. If I don't have a beat, I turn around and go home. So I, I am amazed that you're able to run without without a beat in your ear. Well, Emily, I, I am so thankful that we found this time to, to make this this work. Thank you so much for coming on. And listeners, please go check out her book. Uh, it, it, it's one of the ones that I picked up and was done with so quickly that I was sad because I was like, ah, I read that too quickly. So, Emily, thank you so much for the book, for all your work, and I cannot wait for your next one. Thank you so much, Jay. This was awesome. It was tons of fun. Hey, y'all. It's me, your host. I'm sorry to interrupt what I'm sure is a fantastic episode of the podcast, but I have to give a quick shout out to my partner, Roadrunner CBD. They have been working with me for a while now, and I just love their products. They have everything from tinctures to muscle gels, and all of them are fantastic. You know, I rub the muscle gel on my legs before I run, and they keep me feeling pretty good, which is saying something. So check out Roadrunner today at their website, www.roadrunnercbd.com slash ref, R-E-F slash C-Y-S. Again, that's roadrunnercbd.com slash ref slash C-Y-S, and use the code C-Y-S at checkout to let them know that I sent you and get 10% off. Trust me, you're gonna love this. I've sent some of their products to a couple different people and they've all become repeat customers. So check it out today and don't forget to let them know that Choose Your Struggle sent you. Subscribe to my Patreon for behind the scenes looks at the podcast, sneak peeks, and bonus data. You'll also get a discount on Choose Your Struggle merch. Find it at patreon.com slash choose your struggle. All right, we've come to the end of another episode of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Emily Dufton. I know I did. I am uh, super thankful to to have uh, met her. Um, you know, she was so receptive when I reached out. I, I, I as I said earlier, I heard her speak on a uh, it was it was a webinar a bunch of incredible people doing work in the drug policy space. Um, and, and I go to a lot of those, but there was just the, the way she presented her work and the way she, she talked about this segment of the history of this work that I was not that, that knowledgeable about. I was so blown away by, as I said, I, I bought her book while listening to her speak and then reached out like maybe a week later after I'd read it and was like, I just blew through this. I'm just in, so impressed by your book. It took us a little while to schedule because she is a very busy person, but she was very open to to chatting, uh, and we had a wonderful chat. I'm just so thankful for her time and her work. Um, so the 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 good egg. We're gonna go into that real quick. Uh, the good egg for this week is a couple. You know, number one, as I said before, please buy her book. Check out the bookshop link. Uh, but but you know, beyond that, the first person who reaches out again. Doesn't matter how. Reach out my website. Um, reach out at, at uh, you know social media. Uh, oh, and by the way, people who've been reaching out through the website uh, who have been hearing me, I really appreciate it. In the last three days, I've gotten four or five people reaching out about different things. Actually, real quick, this is not about <laughs> this is not about anything, but I think it's important. Um, somebody reached out through the website because they heard me speak on a different podcast and said, your story really resonated with me. I'm going through something very similar right now. Can you just give me some advice? Uh, we ended up having a 45 minute chat and, and I'm, we're going to stay in touch. I love that. I mean, I, I just so appreciate uh, the, 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 the strength it takes to, to do that. So, um, you know, that's neither here nor there, obviously, other than to say, do it, reach out. I, I'm waiting to hear from you. I love hearing from all of you. And this week, if you reach out the first person to say that they uh, heard this this chat and they want the book, I will send it to you for free. If you reach out afterwards, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> somebody beat you to it, um, but I will I will definitely, uh, you know, maybe I'll send you a sticker or something. How's that? If, if, if you reach out and the book has already been taken, I will send you a sticker. So uh, reach out, uh, buy Emily's book, reach out, and, and, and maybe you'll get the book. Um, but your actual good egg for today goes out to uh, Lauren in Cincinnati. Uh, um, this is not my wife, uh, but a different Lauren, uh, who, who we know each other a little bit from, from our old, my old political days. Um, we had a really interesting chat the other night. She is a Republican. I know. Right. Um, and, and, <laughs> uh, and, and we had a really interesting chat over policy and, and sort of our, our, our hope about where politics is going. Um, 
I, I appreciated that. I appreciated the, what it took for her to have that conversation because uh, it's not easy um, <laughs> to, to, to have that conversation with someone who thinks so differently than you do. Uh, so that's going to be your good egg for this week. In honor of Lauren from Cincinnati, uh, reach out to somebody who uh, is is not, you know, um, your political persuasion. Now, to be clear, I'm not a registered Democrat. So this was not only <laughs> this wasn't just across the aisle. This was across the aisle and then out of the arena. Uh, I, I am a registered independent. So um, for Lauren, that was even harder uh, because she reached out to somebody who who is not uh, just, you know, in the same realm, just a little bit different. But but reach out to somebody who thinks differently from you. It can be, you know, you're a pretty progressive person and they are more centrist. Doesn't matter. And ta- have a real conversation about uh, with, with, with its fact based, right? This wasn't, oh, I feel this. I mean, we actually were like, but this is the reality of this situation. So again, props to Lauren from Cincinnati for doing that. I applaud everyone who does that. Um, and that's your good egg for today. All right. Your card is going to come from the 54 ways to ease the anxious mind pack uh, from Blurt. Uh, thank you, Blurt, as always. Um, your card. Dance as though nobody is watching to a song that evokes lovely memories. I love that. That's a wonderful card. Um, For those of you who don't know, I've said this before, but it's been a while. I have a playlist on... Uh, Spotify. I'll actually put the the it, it in the links to this show. That that sounds good. Uh, called uh like the the positive mental health playlist or, or or good mental health something like that. And I put that on whenever I'm feeling anxious, whenever I am feeling down. Um, I listen to it a lot while I'm walking around the city. Uh, and, and I love it. You know, and recently I don't know who it was. Uh, somebody added a bunch of songs that I don't know. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are the, the playlist shows you who's following and there is a way to see who it was. I just didn't put it in the time to figure it out. Uh, but there are now a bunch of songs on there that I did not add. And I very much appreciate that. So, um, you know, that's a great card. Definitely recommend that and, and check out the, the positive mental health playlist that'll be in your show notes. But as always, more than anything, be vulnerable, show your empathy Spread your love and choose your struggle.